When we last left the colony on dawn, the situation was stable. The second Antipode offensive had brought their age of exploration to an end, but the colonists no longer feared starving to death in their isolation, allowing them to manufacture naval vessels, vehicles, consumer goods, and weaponry. That's when the cracks began to form. The Roving Star Project had returned the Cuban colonists to space, but it was tremendously expensive. Soldiers? Also expensive. Rebuilding after the second Antipode offensive? You got it. Expensive. All these expenses were paid for by increasingly high taxes levied from the central government. Many politicians had always dreamt of breaking free and declaring independence from the Ariadne Council and used the taxes as a wedge issue to create unrest. The dam broke when Kazakh soldiers violently put down a tax revolt in Matar. The Martyrs of Matar became the final breaking point in a long history of discord. The colonists began to panic. The fledgling stock exchange in Marienburg shuttered its doors abruptly. USA Ariadna, Caledonia, and Merovingia all resigned from the governing council in protest and declared themselves fully independent nations. The Rodinian government labeled this an illegal action by extremist demagogues. The situation rapidly escalated into the separatist wars. At the outbreak of the wars, Rodina possessed strategic advantages, but they were outnumbered and surrounded. From Tartary, a region which had been established during the Age of Exploration, and abandoned the space program they were trying to set up on Bienvenue Station. It wasn't going to be enough, though. The city of Mater was the initial landing site on Dawn. As the largest settlement, it had factories and centralized control, which meant armor and supply lines. And while the people of Rodina were the most militarized and had the largest single military, they were still outnumbered and surrounded on all sides by hostile nations. However, Rodina had strategic assets that could not be matched. First and foremost was the aforementioned industrialization and central location. The planet of Dawn had been settled for ease of transit, with all traffic flowing back to Mater. Dispatching troops to any of its fronts was a relatively short distance away, and had the infrastructure to get them there. Second were military assets that other nations could not replicate. The naval base at Gok Burko allowed for a small but potent navy of destroyers and minesweepers that let them protect much of the continent and every coastline. The navy also allowed continuous escorts from Tartary, a newly settled region that was flush with resources and too distant to threaten. Bridging the gap between mobility and offensive power was the Ariadne Air Force, comprised primarily of gunships and helicopters. Finally, Rudina possessed superior intelligence gathering abilities thanks to the Roving Star satellite system. The intel could be well utilized by engineers like the Dozers, who could easily create or demolish cover and pathways under fire. However, the separatist nations also had potent assets of their own. The 5th Regiment, Ohio, had been reconstituted by Old Man Ross during the Depression. Their training was inspired by the American Delta Force, which specialized equipment for diverse team members. Although they were the best trained and equipped, they were hardly the only elite troops that the Kazakhs had to worry about. Rumors soon began to spread of the Unknown Ranger, a single U.S. Ariadne trooper with the skills of ten, who sought vengeance for the death of his squad. This was to say nothing of two other national militaries, all of them trained and equipped. The 45th Highlanders had maintained a direct line of succession, going back all the way to the British Regiment from Earth, and that included equipment, tactical training, and dress uniform kilts. But for Rodina, their enemies were also their greatest assets. None of the newly independent nations wanted to see their neighbors thrive, and they refused any sort of coordination until it was too late. The politicians behind the separatist movements were not of particularly high quality, and the hastily declared separation had not been universally accepted among the citizens of Caledonia, Merovingia, and U.S. Ariadna. When the shooting started, the separatists were already fighting conflicts on multiple fronts, internal and external. The separatist wars were a series of conflicts with periods of peace and integration between them, alternating with bitter and bloody violence. On the one hand, you had time to professionalize the sport of dog bowl, which is similar to rugby or American-style football, but played by dog faces on three lanes, with a certain focus on scrum, let's say. On the other hand, Caledonia was subdued with extreme force. Skara Bray was destroyed by the triumphant Kazakhs, and much of the city was never rebuilt. The Grand Armée's Melvingien, or GRM, caught in the middle of four warring nations, was repeatedly decimated. Although they could fend off any isolated attack, the so-called Kazakh avalanche had the raw force to conquer Marienburg. 
The broken GRM was disbanded afterwards. The USA Ryadin state of Kennedy bore the brunt of the Cossack assault, and while they did slow the Rodinian troops, USA Ryadin was simply not coordinated or populous enough to force the Cossacks back. Every conquered country helped bolster the forces of the motherland. To the surprise of many, Rodina did not exert a totalitarian hand over its conquered foes. They focused their reprisals on the leadership that had caused this issue. The office of the president was de facto abolished in USA Ariadna, even if the Americans refused to change their constitution. But there was no Red Dawn situation to defeat. Hard cases who expected to fight guerrilla warfare for years instead found their services unneeded. There were no occupying armies to strike, only fellow Ariadnans who were also trapped on this planet. Maybe it was time to unite. Out of the ashes of the Separatist Wars arose the Federal Nation of Ariadna. Rodina no longer permitted the use of individual nations. The central leadership in Mater declared that the Nations of Dawn were one country, indivisible, working together for their mutual good. The Ariadnan Federation combined the regional governments and the central government into one system. The Parliament and House of Clans and Congress would be equal to the planetary government, not subordinate. Not everyone was satisfied with this peace. The Mummers in Caledonia survived, continuing to believe that Caledonia needed to stand alone. L'Armée de la Rose in Merovingia still resists Rodinian control, believing that the Cossacks are corrupt and oppressive. The Sons of Liberty in U.S. Ariadna were and are well liked, and U.S. Ariadna would maintain deeply independent spirits throughout Dawn's history. The Americans had reason to be angry. The Cossack Protectorate was territory taken from U.S. Ariadna and established as a temporary buffer between the states and Rodina. Although Rodina attempted to use it to establish an eastern seaport, a mass of Antipode Razia from the south destroyed it. Today, it is a loose association of forts, camps, and abandoned trenches, the crisscrossed vestiges of too many wars. In the years after the war, Ariadna essentially took the same form it has today. The Federal Army took on elements from the four Ariadna nations. Even if it technically only existed on paper, and the four militaries operated more or less independently. Cross-training, however, was more common. Colonel Amélie Augier trained the elite Scots Guard turning the 6th Regiment into a flexible and mobile unit. Although they proved capable, their existence as a foreign-trained unit seemed like a deliberate attack on the Caledonian clan houses. It probably was. Ogier died mysteriously, and the rumor has always been that it was the Cossack intel servants. Local Clyde Rannoch took over, and that name is good and stereotypically Scottish, so it's probably fine. The Caledonians decided that the 2nd in command was just as good. For the next few decades, Ariadna settled down into a slow stagnation. The Cossacks didn't uh, really stick to the equal powers thing. The Rodina mindset was, and is, that Ariadna can only survive if united under one solid government. When they were separate, they were collapsing and dying out. When they were together, they were stronger. That was it. The unity was accomplished by encouraging free trade, low taxes, and sponsoring lots of cultural mingling. Things were peaceful, even if stagnant. All four governments were united in the Ariadnan Council, which gave them more or less equal representation. However, the Rodinian government dominated the Kaptenskaya Verstreka, or the Captain's Council, which functioned as the executive branch. There were many reasons for the stagnation of federal Ariadna. All of the governments on Dawn were hostile towards Rodina getting any greater power, lest it become strong enough to trample them completely. And at the same time, Rodina was very suspicious of all the original governments. Neither side was willing to make any kind of major developments. Nobody okayed the infrastructure bills. Nobody wanted to spend money on the French when there were starving Norwegians in Caledonia. The only thing that really got built was the Trans-Tartaric Railroad, which linked all the nations together with a single gigantic super train. And you know what? It is uh, a really, really big train, and that's great. Love a big train. Infinity loves its trains, you know? There was uh, that one uh, campaign Paradiso mission that has the train that I played once and I thought was probably pretty bad. I got some train. I got some train models. Shit. We got uh, we got the panic room scenarios in ITS. Uh, why not the train? You know, lots of companies make the train, so we got um, you know we could call those out. And uh, you know who else likes the train? Uh, Cossacks. 
Under the Cossacks, the opposition parties were suppressed. Draconian anti-protest laws got passed. The Antipodes attacked again in what would be reckoned as 37 NC. It was the worst attack in more than a century. There was extremely poor coordination from the four states. The Ariadne Air Force was talented at bombing Antipode villages, uh, but soon they were going to be taxed with bombing their own people. In the last few years of Ariadne's isolation, the central government became increasingly paranoid and began a crackdown on illegal activity using the Commercial Trade Acts. This meant that a massive black market, run in part by the Irmandinos, would practically dominate the Ariadne economy. If almost everything you did could be seen as a crime by the Rodinian government, then obviously the black market and criminal gangs that facilitate it are going to gain in prominence. Many of these smuggling organizations became covertly backed by local and then national governments. In fact, these conflicts with the smugglers increasingly became proxy battles infused with national interests. And it looked like they were gearing up for a second round of the Separatist Wars. And uh, they probably would be, except for this crazy invasion of aliens from space with aimbot guns and big eyes and purple hair and fucking six with fucking jetpacks. And then they show Pan Oceania. It was, it was Pan Oceania. Next time, the commercial conflicts and Ariadne's current status. I don't upload much. I don't want to waste your time. Thank you all for watching. If you came here from a podcast or the official Infinity Twitter, let me know in the comments below. Uh, roll safe, and uh, let me know what you would like me to do after Ariadna, because there's a lot of topics to do. Uh, not the uprising. A lot of other options, just not the uprising. I don't know. Ask away. Bye. Take care. Be safe.